It's a lovely day here in Bombay, and I'm, I'm delighted to announce that today's edition will feature photographer Chirodeep Chaudhary and poet and cultural theorist Ranjit Hoskote in a conversation about Chirodeep's ongoing exhibition at Project 88 titled Seeing Time, Public Clocks of Bombay. This project began in 1996 and was first shown at an exhibition, I think at the first Kala Ghura Festival in 1999, where, where coincidentally Ranjit was also involved. So from a small suite of 22 images uh, over the next 23 years, it has expanded to 86 image and uh, indeed is a labor of love. On a personal note, I was new to the city when I saw this at David Sassoon Library and ne never imagined that all these years later, I would be on Zoom with Churadeep and Ranjit talking about the public clocks of Bombay. So a very quick introduction about our two speakers. Churadeep Choudhury is the author of the critically fated book, A Village in Bengal, Photographs and an Essay, a result of his 13 year old, in a 13 year long engagement with his ancestral village in West Bengal and his family's nearly two century old tradition of the Durga Puja. Chiradeep's work documents the urban landscape and he has often been referred to as the chronicler of Bombay. During his career, he has produced diverse documents of his home city in a range of projects like Seeing Time, Public Clocks of Bombay, The One Rupee Entrepreneur, The Commuters, and In a City, A Library, among others. He lives in Bombay and divides his time between his assignments, projects, teaching commitments, and chasing subjects as diverse as manual typewriters, abandoned helmets, and airport smoking rooms. <laughs> Ranjit Hoskote has been, an, uh, has been acclaimed as a seminal contributor to Indian art criticism and curatorial practice, and is also a leading Indian poet. He's the author of more than 30 books, including most recently, Jana Whale, Jonah Whale, sorry, Jonah Whale, published by Penguin in 2018. He has translated the poetry of a 14th century Kashmiri woman mystic as I, Lala, the poems of Lal Ved, again published by Penguin in 2011. Hoskote was curator of India's first ever national pavilion at the Venice Biennale in 2011 and co curated the seventh Gwanju Biennale with Okui and Rizzo. He is the research and curatorial consultant to the Mataf Museum, Doha. So um, a few housekeeping rules before we begin, please mute your microphones and type in any questions that you may have in the comment section of uh, Facebook or in the chat section of Zoom. Um, if you're experiencing any technical difficulties, again, please type it out and we will try to sort it out. Uh, the structure is gonna be as follows. We will be, I think we'll have a few opening remarks from Ranjit followed by a presentation by Chirodeep, and then a brief conversation between the two before we open it up for a question and answer session. I don't think it'll take longer than an hour and you can go and enjoy the rest of Sunday after this. Over to you, Ranji. Thank you so much, Sri. And uh, well, good evening to everybody who has joined us uh, for this session. And Chirodeep, it's a pleasure to, to be uh, doing this with you. Thank because, you. Um, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's been marvelous to follow your work over these many years, uh, longer than two decades. I remember particularly a moment when you came to shoot us at the, at the, at the office of the PEN All India Center at Theosophy Hall, uh, New Marine Lines. Yes. And many of us still use those <laughs> wonderful long ago black and white portraits of young <laughs> poets as we then were. So, <laughs> Uh, you know, and, and of course, it's been a treat to follow all of your work uh, over the years. So I want to begin by offering a few framing remarks, not too many, because they really want us to, uh, be, you know, to look at your present work and seeing time, and then we'll talk about it. I thought I'd begin at a bit of an angle by thinking about the daily newspapers. Uh, and many of us, of course, know that uh, the front page is traditionally thought of as being a vertical that stretches between the masthead at the top and the anchor below. And there's obviously a reason for this strange maritime and nautical uh, imagery, because again, as many of us will know, the front pages of newspapers uh, through the 18th and 19th century were really devoted to the, the shipping schedules. Uh, times of uh, docking and loading, arrival and departure, high tide and low tide. And it's also the reason why so many early newspapers were simply called the times of something, because uh, they literally were, it's not metaphorically 
the times that we live in, but the very precise times by which we calibrate our comings and goings and um, mobility in an increasingly uh, uh, globalized uh, age as it then was. And I say all this also keeping in mind that <laughs> When we go back to the early, the Norse and the Anglo-Saxon roots of the language, the, the word tide is really just another word for time. Tide and time mean exactly the same thing. So time is ubiquitous, it presses upon us, and in profound ways, it's been at the core of your own practice, Chirudeep. When I think about how you, for instance, uh, documented, and this word is used loosely sometimes, chronicled, uh, particularly the, the life of Bombay through its objects and places. I want us to maybe through the course of this evening and as we look closely at your marvelous work on the clocks of Bombay, I want us to think about what exactly this act of chronicling, literally of producing an account of time, what does that involve? On the one hand with you, there's been a very strong documentarian impulse that emerges from an early context of your work in photojournalism. But there's equally, at least to my eye and surely to the eye of many of, of your viewers, there is a, uh, there's an enduring poetics which focuses on the ruin. It focuses on questions of survival. And uh, as I would maybe express it here, what, what I find fascinating about your work is the way in which you reflect on the social life of objects and places. And uh, I know to you what's important quite often is the key detail that you're looking at, but the way in which you frame it also allows us to speculate on the details, other lives. Where is it to be placed in the context of a city's arc of development or its arc of collapse sometimes? And uh, when I think about so many of your long-term engagements with whether it's the clocks, whether it's the commuters on Bombay's <clears> local <throat> trains, whether it's the typewriter, which is another of your projects, or indeed this venerable library in Dobi Talao in South Bombay and the incredible atlases and encyclopedias and books in diverse languages that it has or had. And then your long-term engagement with the Durga Puja in your ancestral village in Bengal. Now, in each one of these, there is an interplay between obsolescence on the one hand and some attempt at continuity on the other. What is it that falls to time, decay, mortality? What is it that continues in time and takes advantage of the processes of time? So time, in some sense, is your medium, no matter what your ostensible subject. So these are some of the things that I wanted to put in play. I also want us to be attentive to the different scales of temporality that operate in your images. And as we go along, maybe I'll dwell on some of my favorite images in seeing time. I've been particularly fascinated by your, uh, your uh, pursuit of clocks in uh, what effectively are temple cities within the city and the way in which they counterpose our diurnal and nocturnal cycles with uh, cycles that have to do with the yoga and the kalpa through the figures of gods and sages and uh, ascetics that frame what is otherwise seemingly the, the great symbol of modernity. So as we go along, I hope to draw you out more also on, these, uh, on, these, on some of these questions. Uh, also to think through with you how across the 23 uh, year period, that you've worked on this, uh, your subject, the city of Bombay, has itself moved from a certain set of a certain framework of temporality to quite another. I think when you began, we were still very much in the wake of uh, a city that had really been formatted along the mill shifts and the sirens that announced the shifts and the ebb and flow of the railways, for instance, and why indeed were there so many clocks all over the place, uh, to a time now where we are at home in multiple parallel, quite divergent scales of transcontinental time uh, and where the city itself has no fixed rush hour any longer. I'm not just speaking of the period of the pandemic, but generally we are operating at different kinds of scales within our bodies as a collective <coughs> through intersecting forms of community. So how does all that influence the way in which you approach uh, the clock? And uh, 
it may later, maybe in the questions, I'll also, when we get to the, our conversation, I'd also like to draw you out on your particular sources of inspiration and uh, points of reference in terms of how you approach this work and also how you see yourself uh, really, um, not to make too much of a sharp division here, but between the realm of photojournalism and the realm of what is sometimes rather, from my point of view, quaintly and sadly called art photography. <laughs> uh, which tends not to take into account that many of the most iconic images we think of as art photography really began in say Life magazine, all the great magnum images and so forth. So this is by way of framing remarks so that, um, uh, you know, uh, invite us to hold some of these thoughts in mind as we approach and immerse ourselves in seeing time. And uh, also to say that I've followed this particular series from 1999, when you showed your first uh, results of your, of your Flaneresque quest through the city, uh, two various glimpses I've had of it over time. Then indeed to the showing from it that took place around this time last year, early last That's year. Right. That's right. Uh, as part yeah. of the Women Design Exhibition, which was a very, very different context. And now when we see it uh, in a kind of chapterized exhibition format, so just to say that each time I've been struck quite differently by it. And, uh, and I'll hope to say more about it at the far end of your presentation. Mm. So without further ado, I'm now gonna turn it over to you, Chirti. Uh, thank you, Ranjit. Um, thank you, Shri, for uh, getting me to do this. Uh, so let me, let me start, let me just share the screen. Uh, okay, so. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to uh, do a, a, a kind of short presentation uh, and take you all through uh, a couple of aspects of, of how this project happened. One of them, uh, you know, people, people often keep asking me about how I went about uh, finding these clocks. Uh, you know, it, it's because, you know, most people, uh, they, they kind of tell me, uh, you know, if, if you were to kind of push them, they wouldn't be able to. Uh, come up with with more than uh, four or five max, you know, and these are usually uh, the usual suspects around uh, around four. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, I mean, quite quite uh, naturally, you know, there was there was a lot of walking that was done, and this this was you know this this project started in 1996 uh, when I was when I you know those were very early days in my career as as a news photographer and. Part of the thing that we did as news photographers was, I mean, you know, in between assignments in those days, uh, there was uh, there was this kind of photograph that was termed as the offbeat photograph. So we we always always had to kind of walk around the city in 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 search of these offbeat photographs, you know. Uh, so these were what were kind of the standalone photographs, the non-newsy photographs, and. Uh, so this kind of made it easy in a way, uh, you know, for me to, to spend time uh, and not think about the fact that, you know, I was, I was not, not in office or was shirking, shirking work or something like that. But, uh, you know, so, so a, a large section of, of the clocks were really found uh, just walking. I mean, you, you would probably, you know, start walking down a particular street and uh, and and you know probably have a gut feel about a certain lane and you say I I think there's a temple here or I think you know uh, there is a building there which which has a certain kind of elevation I remember that building I've seen it once let me go and check it out I mean so so that's that's initially that that's really how it started uh, and one of the things that happened uh, you know as as the years went by was uh, I, I started, you know, when I started discussing the idea with, with friends and with people, people around me, I started seeing how they were getting very excited by the idea, you know, I mean, from the sheer curiosity of the idea. I didn't know of too many clocks then, uh, but as, as the numbers kept growing and I would keep telling people, I, I figured that people were also beginning to, uh, you know, get co-opted into into the process. I mean, you know, sometimes they would call me and alert me to, about a clock. Uh, so, so in many ways, I mean, you know, this is this is the sort of crowdsourced uh, 
work before crowdsourcing became became a term that that is sort of used. Uh, and there was obviously some amount of serendipity as well. I'll I'll come to those as I as I show you some of the pictures. So so this 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 is this photograph of the Prince's Triumphal Arch, which is uh, you know near Mahalakshmi Temple at opposite uh, the erstwhile Cadbury House. Uh, this was actually first brought to my notice by my mother, and it's very strange because my mother I didn't think had uh, the habit of really noticing things till before this but i think i mean she had she had probably uh, gotten on board the idea along with me you know so uh, uh, so this is this is actually a, a, a photograph that was shot fairly recently and i'm mentioning this because you know a lot of these photographs a lot of these structures or buildings have been shot on on multiple occasions and i think this is an interesting aspect of doing projects over enormously long periods of time you know you you discover uh, vantage points. You 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 uh, get introduced to people who suddenly offer offer you their balcony to look out of, and you know, they suddenly say, "Oh, you know, you you can from my building, you can see from my balcony or from my office window, you can see the Rajabai Tower or whatever." I mean, so so uh, so the the early picture that I had shot of this, which was part of that exhibition in ninety nine. Uh, was uh, a, a, a photograph, uh, you know, I think in those days, I mean, my, my, my discerning ability wasn't, uh, was, wasn't particularly good. I mean, in the sense that I think it, it's kind of improved with time, you know what I'm saying? So, uh, so I think the photograph that was there, uh, I think it was just waiting perhaps to be improved upon. And I think uh, this is the photograph that was done uh, some years back. And I think it was possible again because you see you see these pickle shops that have kind of come up here. These weren't there when I had first photographed it in about ninety seven or something like that. So I think these sort of changes, which kind of certainly meant that the crowd would kind of move in a certain way, and you know you were able to do a certain kind of picture. But it also meant that you know you're constantly on the lookout. You're constantly kind of going to these places. Uh, this is uh, the the Dwarkadish Temple. And again, a very strange kind of way in which I discovered this clock. I mean, uh, I was <clears throat> I was uh, walking around Kalba Devi with uh, with T. S. Satyan, uh, the photographer, who had actually uh, who was having a retrospective in Bombay, and he kind of said, you know, for the exhibition before it goes to Delhi, I would like to uh, do some more pictures. And I was walking with him in Kalba Devi, and I remember seeing this temple, and where the clock is, I mean, oops, sorry, where the, where the clock is, there was, it was just a, an empty gaping hole. Uh, but there was that, there was that window, there was that, that glass uh, pane over there. And uh, I had a feeling that it might be a clock. And a couple of months later, I happened to be sitting at the office of Dinodia Photo Agency. Uh, you know, in those days, we had to kind of uh, go through sheets of slides to kind of uh, find photographs. And while I was waiting, I kind of chanced upon a color, uh, color Xerox of a vintage postcard of this particular temple. You know, it's, it's usually referred to as the monkey temple for some reason. Uh, <clears throat> and you could see the clock there. And uh, so I suddenly had another clock on my list, but uh, one had to wait for this clock to kind of miraculously reappear a couple of years later, and which is when this photograph was done. So, so you know, serendipitous stuff like this has happened. I was talking about the crowdsourcing part. I mean, so I very often receive uh, messages now on WhatsApp, but earlier people would call me and tell me they would email me with with photographs and things like that. This is uh, something that was sent to me. Uh, you know, it's, it's it's very funny. I mean. You were mentioning Ranjit about the show that happened last year uh, around this time, and uh, just after the show, the lockdown happened, and you know we reopened at Project 88 in uh, in I think in uh, December. In these intervening nine or ten months, I was alerted to about a dozen clocks, dozen more. Uh, and I think it was staggering because, uh, I mean, of course, many had to be, one had to go and check them out because, you know, there were also cases of this kind, which is this re uh, restaurant called the Radio Restaurant uh, near Crawford Market, uh, which turned out that it wasn't a clock, but it was just these coat of arms 
and those you know the cross swords kind of created this sort of a, a, a sense that those might have been been the hands the missing hands of the clock uh, these are two more i mean this is mangalda's market i came across this photograph and then we started chasing it uh, this is uh, the swadeshi market on the right uh, this was on uh, the instagram handle of my friend simin patel uh so we went and you know so now in the beginning when i was doing this project i hadn't thought of say including clocks of this kind i mean these kind of uh you know as, as the project progressed i mean one kept thinking about what might uh, you know one one debated about these things about does do does this kind of tick tick the box and can it be included as a public clock i mean and and i think it it did and eventually we kind of did this photograph but i'm saying this is this some of the ways in which these uh, you know i've also been alerted to to some of the these clocks this one on the left uh, which is actually also one of my favorites it's also one of the most uh, odd ones this is above the uh, door of an elevator <laughs> of the punjab national bank building again uh, told to me by simin patel uh, and again it kind of got me thinking about can this actually be uh you know one of the clocks that i'm looking at i mean is it actually a public clock because my original definition was that uh you know this they had to be on on the on the facades of buildings but you know this was in the foyer of the building and uh this is where people you know just you as you got off the pavement and entered the building and you're waiting for the elevator i, I kind of uh debated it with myself and i said it, it's still a sort of a public space uh it's it, it's public access and uh, so this one happened it was interesting how the one on the right then came about i mean after finding this i decided to just walk around firoz shah mehta road and just poke my head into all these buildings to just see are there any other like this and i happened to chance upon the united india assurance building which is actually just opposite the punjab national bank and uh it was it was curious because you know i had gone to this building every year my father used to send me to this building to pay the insurance premium and i had never noticed the clock uh but i think i mean maybe there's a time for everything and you know so it it kind of revealed itself to me then uh, this again was something that was uh pointed out to me by by a friend by my friend chavi sajdev uh during one of her walks uh you know i there are also certain neighborhoods which you kind of think that they may not have clocks and so you're probably not going you're not walking around those areas you're probably not exploring those areas and this was one of those i mean around gamdevi i somehow never thought there might be a clock there and uh, but i mean i think it required the help of a friend to kind of find this uh, this again was is probably one of the most interesting finds uh, you know my friend rajendra aklekar who works for midday and and uh, is the author of books on the railways and things like that he kind of had uh, published a front page story on this particular clock it also happens to be one of the the really old old clocks in the city uh, it's again something that you will not get to see uh, from the street outside you know while you're walking or while you're moving around in in taxis or buses or whatever because this is inside the the complex of the western railway locomotive shed uh it's an interesting one because you know and the railway is a very proud of it because it still uh it kind of uh, still works and the dial has uh, the bombay baroda and central india railway kind of uh painted on it uh, it's a very delicate kind of mechanism the railway still uh have uh you know two people who are in charge of maintaining it and uh, you know uh, th those people are kind of due for retirement in a few years and i'm sure and they 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 themselves are kind of worried about what would happen uh, once once they leave because there are no no newer people who have been trained for its upkeep uh, <clears throat> this is actually one of the more recent ones that i found just in fact just a couple of uh weeks before the show opened at project 88 uh you know uh this was again in a book uh by a friend uh, meher marfatia and towards the end of the book there was this photograph by uh 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 
God, uh, forgetting the name. Uh, there was this photograph, uh, you know, in, in the book. And uh, but it was one of those slightly difficult buildings to track because nobody seemed to really know where it was. There was no, it just said Ketwadi and, uh, you know, uh, and, and uh, sorry, this was a Foynison photograph. I got the name. Uh, and uh, it, it's interesting. We eventually found the building, but it, it, it doesn't look anything like, that that uh, photograph by uh, by by Foynison. Uh, you know, there's that 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 high rise which has come up. I mean, the tree has grown, but thankfully the clock was still visible from this one angle. Yeah, <clears throat> this is this is perhaps the most strange clock. Uh, it's actually not a clock. It's actually more an engraving of a clock on a building uh, at Slater Road near Grant Road. Uh, you know, which was actually found uh, spotted by my friend Abod Aras. Uh, and, you know, I, I remember uh, coming across uh, things like this uh, in Udwada. And funnily enough, uh, locals told me that, you know, these were usually done by, by uh, less affluent residents who couldn't afford to put up a clock. Uh, so they would kind of have the design of a clock. Uh, I came across similar things in in uh, in this town called Sidpur, which is near Gujarat, uh, which has these uh, you know the, these many mansions of the Bori Muslims. I came across a house there which had three such uh, designs of clocks on it. Uh, <clears throat> another thing that has uh, been a matter of great curiosity for a lot of visitors to the show are you know what are these missing clocks that I have written. In, in the in the image captions, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> so over these years, I mean, as part of research, you know, some one of the things, two things, couple of things that have uh, happened. I mean, one is that I've come across a lot of vintage photographs, uh, which have which which kind of tell me that there was there were some more clocks which existed, uh, you know, so, and and uh, uh, though those aren't around anymore. Like there's one. Uh, very uh, popular photograph that does the rounds on social media, which is of the statue of the Khada Parsi, which at its original location, which was at the Nagpara Junction. And uh, there's a building that you see behind it called, I think the Memani building or something, or the Memni building, I think, which had a clock. The building is still there, but the clock, uh, the, the, the part on top of the building, which had the clock has disappeared. So, so there are about six or seven such clocks which have disappeared. Uh, so this one, uh, uh, you know, is on the outside of the Brabon Stadium, uh, uh, pretty much just above where the Kerustam's ice cream shop is. And I remember seeing it. It was a difficult one to spot because, you know, the tree used to cover it all the time and you could occasionally catch a glimpse. And uh, I kept waiting you know, for, uh, you know, the trees to get trimmed and things like that. And one fine day, the, bill, the you know, the, the stadium was getting a makeover and the clock kind of disappeared. And I think it was a sort of a shock for me, this thing of, you know, waiting uh, for an opportune time and not having done at least an initial photograph to at least record it. Uh, similar things have happened. I mean, you know, it happened with the Swadeshi Mill I used to keep seeing it, uh, you know, while my train used to cross Kurla Station. And I used to keep thinking, oh, I should go and photograph it. I should go and photograph it. I never actually managed to get down at Kurla, go to Chunabati and do the photograph. And then one fine day, there was a fire. And, uh, you know, like it is common with, with a lot of uh, old buildings, which, which, are, uh, which, are, which are prime real estate. Uh, so this this clock kind of went missing. The clock tower you can still see it here. Uh, <clears throat> that's another one which is Aurora Cinema. I remember seeing it even when I was a kid. Uh, you know, while we would pass, uh, you know, Matunga in 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 the bus going into town, and I remember kind of spotting the clock. And again, I mean, I guess I mean in the early years, I mean, I was spending so much of time. Uh, exploring South Bombay that, I mean, you know, I, I was making less efforts to kind of walk around these areas, at least in the initial years when I was doing this work. And uh, one fine day, this clock had gone. I mean, it's interesting because the, we, I was told by the, by the present owner that how 
you know, uh, during one of the monsoons, uh, which is another great problem of that buildings in Bombay face, uh, due to seepage, uh, all the parts of the build of, of the clock inside had kind of corroded, and the clock had stopped functioning. And you know, uh, and then one fine day, uh, the maintenance guys they just kind of sold it off as scrap. I mean, without informing. Uh, the owner and that's that's how another of these clocks kind of disappeared uh, <clears throat> this uh, this is a, a a drinking water fountain uh, or what is popularly known as the piaus this is at masjid uh, masjid and uh, you can actually see a clock here but it's not the original clock i mean the the piao was uh, was restored as part of you know the bombay the bombay piao project uh, you know which restored many of many of the drinking water fountains but the clock was not uh, was never uh, restored. So what you see here is 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 one of these uh, ajanta clocks that you see uh, hanging at people's houses, which has kind of been uh, placed placed inside there. It it uh, used to work, uh, but I guess till till the batteries used to work. Uh, that's another one. Uh, you know, it it kind of made me wonder for a long time whether it actually was a clock. Uh, my sense was, you know, when I first saw it, I mean, because of of that uh, that you know the the design at the center, which kind of gave me a inkling that it might be a clock. And then over the years, uh, talking to priests and things like that in the in the complex, uh, very few again could remember whether it was a clock. Uh, but but a few of them actually told me and then it got corroborated with other people kind of uh, you know telling us confirming that it was a clock so this is another one that has been missing for uh, for quite a few decades now uh, this is the mangaldas market that i showed a photograph earlier uh, a screenshot from a whatsapp chat uh, this again had to be kind of uh, we had to kind of go and figure it out um, you know because what what gave me a sense that it was a clock is the fact again that I mean this this particular uh, glass here. I mean uh, some people kept telling me that you know it was probably a a, a bust of some guy, but I, I kind of I doubt that it was was a bust of a of a local uh, important person. Uh, then eventually you know we we kind of managed to speak to some. Uh, older people in the neighborhood uh, who kind of weren't, uh, who kind of gave us uh, differing dates about, you know, how long back the clock kind of disappeared, uh, you know, but, but then it got confirmed that there was a clock. So these are some of the missing clocks. This is another one. This is actually, I think, a very fascinating one. Again, uh, I don't know, maybe, maybe some of you all who have tuned in might remember, uh, you know, at uh, at the hanging gardens, uh, there used to be a, a huge uh, a water tank. I mean, you might remember this structure. You know, uh, I don't remember it though. I remember being taken to hanging gardens from uh, for for school excursions and stuff. And one of my students who was once helping me on the project kind of had seen this and had asked, "Do you think this could be a clock?" And I had kind of brushed it off, saying, "You know, there are various there are many buildings with such roundels." And uh, all of them are quite likely not clocks. And uh, then I think friends and uh, people who had kind of heard me talk about the project kind of uh, started uh, getting in touch with me, sending me these vintage photographs. So uh, my friend Rajan Jaikar had sent me this, but you couldn't really figure very clearly that it was a clock. Uh, and then eventually, uh, you know, another friend, Vinayak, kind of sent me this photograph from where it got pretty much confirmed that it was a clock. Uh, but obviously, you know, now uh, that water tank has been replaced by a syntax, and uh, this is just a gaping hole here. Uh, <clears throat> this one, I mean, we reached perhaps, uh, you know, about a year, year and a half too late. Uh, the clock uh, used to be up here. Uh, on on top of this this pillar, it used to be a square clock uh, in in the middle of this this compound uh, in in Matunga called Agarwal Nagar, and uh, the clock stopped working. I mean, you know, and uh, we were told that 
you know, in the evenings, residents would usually assemble here. So since the clock wasn't working, they figured it's better to remove it. And, and then tube lights were installed, which, which probably served a better purpose. So that's another one that has gone missing. Uh, this, this is in, uh, in Cyan. Uh, again, uh, you know, the, the family, uh, they, 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 they would really love to, they, they say they would really love to have the clock back. But I mean, in the meanwhile, uh, you know, they, they kind of put out a bowl of water there uh, for, for the birds to come in, especially during summers. So uh, some people in the neighborhood kind of remember it. They remember this building as, as you know, the Ghadiwala building, uh, you know. But I mean, if, if you talk to obviously newer residents and, you know, uh, some of the shops below, few people remember it now. Uh, again, it was kind of pointed out to me through a complete casual conversation with another friend who suddenly remembered because a friend of hers used to reside in this building. And, uh, you know, they, uh, and, and she remembered this building as being referred to as Ghadiwala building, uh, colloquially. This was uh, probably one of the strangest uh, uh, finds. I lived in Mazgaon for many years. And, uh, you know, every time that I would get onto the uh, bike, the JJ flyover, I would look at uh, you know, the, the JJ hospital and kind of wonder could those have been clocks, uh, you know, and because it's got those 12 markings, I mean, it, it's, it, it seems like a clock and nothing else. And, uh, but there were no photographs, no old photographs that were kind of popping up uh, in my search. And then one day I happened to be sitting at the shop uh, of a friend of mine who kind of, it's, it's a very old uh, shop of photography equipment and uh, a gentleman uh, had just walked in a few minutes before uh, uh, he he was a he's a very he was a very famous uh, well very, very well known uh, uh, throat uh, specialist dr kambata and he happened to be talking with them right at that moment and saying you know how he had been talking to the uh, the, the, the dean at the hospital at that point and saying, oh, you know, you must do something and get this clock working again. And so, so it's, it's complete serendipity how it got confirmed. Uh, so uh, now, uh, you know, it's, it's just recently now that the clock has been, uh, is, is back again. I mean, thanks to uh, the efforts of the, the alumni of the Grant Medical College. So it's, it's kind of put me in a bit of a quandary as to should I photograph the, you know, the building with, with the clock and not just have the missing clock here. I'll just talk to you a bit about, you know, some of the interesting encounters that happened. Uh, you know, uh, so one of the things that we started doing in the last about three, four years uh, was I had one of my students to work with me uh, as, as my uh, research assistant. And we kind of did a, a, whole, a very large number of interviews with, with uh, people around the city, uh, you know, uh, with random people trying to get a sense of how, what was their connect with these clocks? How did they remember these clocks? I mean, you know, what did it mean to them once upon a time when these clocks were? Uh, so, so this particular one, I mean, you know, we, this is an Atash Bairam uh, at Dobitala. Obviously, we weren't allowed to go in. So, uh, so, so uh, Surya Sarthi was speaking with uh one of the priests uh on on the steps of the atash Bairam, and uh, he kind of happened to mention as as a as a complete throwaway comment as to how uh you know the the grandfather clocks that are inside uh the atash Bairam are are still timed to uh, bombay time and it's it's an interesting uh, bit of information because you know there was a time uh, in in the late 1800s, uh, around 1870s, from 1870s to about 1905, when uh, you know there were three different kinds of time uh, that were that were simultaneously being followed in in Bombay. Uh, one of them was Bombay time, uh, you know, which which was the local time in the city as per the position of 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 the sun. 
uh, Ranjit was talking about, uh, you know, the, the ships uh, and uh, how the newspapers uh, kind of displayed uh, shipping timetables. There was so there was this other time that was also being followed in Bombay. Uh, this was around, uh, you know, eighteen around the eighteen nineties, uh, mid eighteen nineties. What was called as the port signal time, uh, which was synchronized to to uh, to GMT, and these these were followed by uh, by by the ships that were docked on the eastern what, what we call today as the eastern waterfront. So uh, so so uh, you know. There were kind of anecdotal stuff of this kind that would emerge from from a lot of the uh, encounters that we would have. I mean, this is again uh, one of one of my very favorite clocks in the city. It's it's actually on it's actually on 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 the signboard of a of a shop. Uh, the shop is now closed. It actually closed uh, exactly in the year that they completed a centenary, uh, and uh, the, the the shop. Used to basically sell, uh, you know, uh, the Maharashtrian Navari sari, the and dhotis, and you know various ready-made uh, garments of that kind. And since people kind of stopped, uh, you know, buying, the owner told me, you know, who's who's buying saris anymore. So uh, so we have decided. So the shop's not doing great business. So they've kind of down their shutter. The shop, uh, the premise is still still operational. The clock is still there, thankfully. Uh, <clears throat> this is uh, the kind of two buildings of this kind in the city. The kind of private residences which have uh, clocks. Uh, this is uh, this is at Ville Parle, uh, just opposite the Pavan Hans uh, Airport. Uh, you know, it's it's the it's the home of the Bhagat family, and uh, th th there's another one of this kind at CP Tank, which is the the home of the Pitre family. That clock doesn't work. This one kind of continues to work. The Pitre family kind of uh, takes great care. I mean, so so that's that room there. Uh, you know, is uh, is is one of the bedrooms where uh, the mechanism of the clock is. It's a very delicate kind of mechanism. This clock. So the family used to run a, <clears throat> a clocks business at Abdul Rahman Street near Crawford Market, and uh, so. Uh, you know, so they, they had these German engineers come and uh, install this clock uh, on top of their house. Uh, it, it's really, you know, it, it's really one of those uh, things that they're very proud of, of the fact that, you know, theirs is one of the few homes in the city that uh, has this clock. Uh, in fact, the, the, young, uh, the young daughter in the family kind of told me that, you know, she feels very proud because not one of her friends can actually boast that they have a house which has a clock. And uh, that it's, it's kind of like a family heirloom that they would continue uh, to look after for as long as they can. Uh, <clears throat> this, is, uh, this is a clock that doesn't work again. Uh, you know, it, it's something that, it's one that you may have seen in, in, in scores of Hindi films, you know, uh, in, in passing. Uh, in fact, one of the uh, films where it's very, very popularly seen, uh, very, or rather very prominently seen, sorry, is in this Devanand film called Fantouche, where Devanand is actually hanging from, from the clock, uh, you know, and in, in a bit to commit suicide. Uh, and, uh, you know, the family, uh, it, it's, uh, you know, it, it's an interesting thing. I mean, the, the, you know, a lot of these clocks don't work and people often think that it's got to be, or it's got to do only with apathy. But, uh, you know, the, the family, I remember them kind of telling me, uh, you know, very sarcastically about how, thanks to the Rent Control Act, how, uh, you know, the kind of rent that they, they kind of get from any of these flats is kind of less than uh, the price of a dish uh, being served at Cream Center on, on the ground floor. Uh, it's also another very interesting thing about the clock is, uh, you know, I, you know, most people of my vintage certainly won't remember it, which is that there used to be a, a revolving uh, neon sign on top of the building, a Mercedes Benz neon sign. It was India's first uh, revolving neon sign. And uh, as, as, and as an anecdote that, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the Javeris told me, it seems, I mean, Nehru was once in, in Bombay and uh, he was, his motorcade was going down uh, Marine Drive, I think, en route to the airport. And Nehru, it seems, kind of saw this and he kind of, you know, the motorcade stopped and Nehru stood at Marine Drive kind of gawking at it. 
and he was then told that you know this was this was the first that this is a kind of you know, this is the only uh, revolving neon sign in in uh, in the country so i mean there are all these sort of very interesting anecdotes and i think i mean when i'm doing my projects i mean you know apart from the photography and stuff but i think this is a thing that i really love about the process you know about the very long engagement uh, that it allows me uh, okay so i think i will uh, end my uh, presentation here and i think we can we can perhaps uh, continue uh, with uh, you know with with ranjit uh, i hope i didn't overshoot my time ranjit no no you're doing fine actually okay thanks okay. so much okay uh, and it was marvelous to follow your follow your work follow seeing time and all of its contexts and uh, as you were speaking there were just so many things that came across uh, with particular and somewhat elegiac force even if you will i was just struck by how uh, how much like a reliquary uh, this set of images is for several reasons at least one would be uh, you know when when you when you look at what's around the focal point of the clock now full chandras which you just showed us uh, there's a part of an ad that you read which clearly refers to india's um, 50 uh, years 50 years of independence so yes. clearly that was shot in 1997 that's right and then you begin to think about uh, horizons of anticipation of aspiration and what has happened but also whichever image you care to look at i was just struck by how you we as viewers can make inferences about the histories of economic change for instance uh, also from some of the things you said and what we might imagine from what you from your images we're also thinking here about the transformation in occupations and livelihoods you know you spoke in the context of the railway yard clock uh, about how there's no mm. training now for these people right, right anymore and it suddenly uh, my mind went off to another part of my life where many years ago i learned that uh, on the payroll and muster of the national gallery of modern art in new delhi there still was a position of a pankhawala ah <laughs> <laughs> the pankhawala you know pankhas right. to punkify right. yes. but he clearly did other things mm. but technically there still was a pankhawala but mm. neither the device nor the training that went with it but also was thinking how of how across the two decades and longer that you've been working on this uh, we're also looking here at conditions of labor flows of capital ways in which groups and communities have asserted themselves historically or even closer to the present time so my first question really will have to be about that uh, uh, chiro uh, what is your uh well, how do you distribute your focus so on the one hand there's the conceptual unity that you bring to the series and you do think in series which is uh in one sense a very modernist notion of serialism but also it is very documentary you're producing a typology uh and before i get ahead of my own thinking here i want us to at some point think about say uh, bant and hilla becher as a possible point of reference for you but to come back here how do you distribute your focus even when you're clearly in pursuit of this clock you know because they are public clocks so to what extent are you also thinking of memorializing conditions of labor as it might be forms of capital the occupations questions of architecture and urban design could i draw you out on that so i i remember uh, you know when i when i first uh, started uh, photographing these buildings uh like i said i was i was very new in in my career as a photographer and i i think i was reacting to it uh as as purely trying to do photographs of these buildings and then uh i think very very soon i happened to get introduced to to sharda vivedi who kind of i think uh interestingly uh you know uh i think uh got me to to start seeing the city you know in in ways that i wasn't seeing before um, and i think you know the the idea of uh, trying to then photograph these buildings in a way that uh, you know you get a sense of of the location mm -hmm. uh, and I, so so a lot of the early photographs i mean i think that was that was also an attempt that was being made i mean you know uh, so if you look at the photographs of like say the david sassoon library if you look at the fulchan nivas if you look at uh you know uh 
God, I mean, you know, I, I uh, the the Indian sailors' home. I mean, you know, uh, uh, you know the uh, the prince's dock. I mean, you know, some of yeah. the photographs that have kind of lasted. Uh, you know, these, you know, the the twenty five years uh, that I've been chasing it. So I think, I mean, uh, you know, it it started out. I mean, I think this this is what I was really trying to do, and I think then, uh, you know, I think various other kind of challenges started uh, to crop up. For instance, you couldn't do a photograph like that with, say, Crawford Market, because you suddenly realize that even though the focus of my uh, photograph is the clock, I mean, it, it kind of occupies a really tiny percentage of the frame, so you can't really all the time be shooting uh, these, these sort of cityscapes. Uh, you know, uh, I think uh, I, I was also, uh, you know, as in, in in the later years, I mean, uh, I as as you saw, as you kept seeing the city kind of change. I mean, as mm -hmm. I was as I was uh, going into other neighborhoods, like for instance, you know, in the in the first showing, uh, there weren't too many photographs from, like, say, Girgaon. There weren't photographs from the other. I mean, from side in the Parel Masjid. Those clocks hadn't been photographed till then. I mean, they were largely photographs in South Bombay. So, so I think in when I started walking around those areas, I think it, you know, it it became necessary to kind of bring in aspects of those neighborhoods into into the photographs. So if you look at, for instance, that photograph of uh, you know the the Keshavji Nayak Piao, yes. I mean, it was it was necessary to kind of. Uh, show show the kind of you know in fact this was an attempt to kind of show the density of of the neighborhood but i mean you know it's not always possible to kind of photographically uh, do justice to that because i mean you know the, the the geometry just doesn't hold i mean you know the the way those you know if you're shooting from above i mean you know the the top of the trucks and you know things like that so but i think those were attempts i mean in some in some cases i think uh, some cases i think one one succeeded more uh, better than in other cases you know yeah uh, yeah yeah i'm also struck by as you were speaking it struck me that another of the productive tensions in this project is uh, the fact that uh, there's a series of absences i mean the processes of urban I hesitate to use the word development, but anyway, urban growth of one kind or another is producing a series of absences. And uh, there's a tr the trace of those absences is present in what you're doing because mills, for instance, are being demolished, right. left, right, and center. Very few of them survive. Mm -hmm. What we are now being encouraged to call single screen uh, cinema mm -hmm. halls, which were just good old movie halls in the old days, right. they're coming down. So uh, edifices that might have boasted such clocks are vanishing. So whilst that is happening on the one hand, yours is a mapping project on the other. So I just wanted to maybe draw you out on that aspect of, of your practice and whether that's actually been articulated as a, an actual kind of urban cartography because you explore commercial and residential complexes, mm, monuments, yeah, temples, yeah, the whole typology yeah, 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 of architecture. Yeah. So, so tell us about the mapping. So, so, so I remember, you know, like I was mentioning, I mean, a lot of these photographs were shot on multiple occasions. And I think you, this this is one of the things that was very interesting to kind of notice about how the backgrounds were kind of changing. For instance, the photograph of the Sassoon clock tower, uh, you know, with uh, you know, with, with with all those leaves of the trees, you know, yes. in, in the foreground. That photograph, I mean, uh, was I mean, you know, it was actually done uh, just just to kind of exhaust a roll of film and saying like, okay, I'm going to come back. I'm going to come back tomorrow when the, when the light is perfect in the morning. And, uh, you know, next overnight there was rain, there were rains and you know, there was a kind of storm. And I mean, you know, those, those trees kind of, the, that, that, that kind of, that design that was created by the leaves kind of disappeared. So that photograph, I mean, every time I went back to photograph it, I never got it. But if you were to go there now and try and do the same photograph, you would actually, in the old photograph, what you see as the as the black, empty sky, you would now see Planet Godridge at the back, you know. So, so that's the kind of um, and, and and you know. So, so I mean, I I remember kind of debating. I mean, you know, do I want to do that photograph? And uh, somehow uh, it it wasn't working. But I'm saying these are these are questions that one was, uh, you know, uh, these were kind of things that one was trying to tackle. For instance, if you see the Buleshwar 
Ram Mandir photograph. You know, the yes. early early attempts of photographing the Buleshwar Ram Mandir were always from from the street level, and uh, they they weren't very successful photographs. There were kind of many attempts. I mean, you know, fa failed for various reasons. But I mean, at a later stage, I mean, you know, when I kind of discovered a vantage point, I mean, one of the one of the balconies. By that time, I mean, you know, this, this humongous kind of high rise had had kind of almost come up behind the temple and kind of had dwarfed this particular temple, you know, making it look much like a Ganpati Mandap, you know, in, in terms of scale, if you, you know. So these sort of things were happening. I mean, you know, uh, if you, uh, you know, I mean, I mean, I think, for instance, you know, the, the, the kind of cars that you were seeing, you know, in, in, in the photographs earlier, I mean, uh, I mean, for instance, I mean, you know, I used to love seeing uh, I mean, not not to fetishize it, but I mean, I, I kind of used to like seeing the Fiat cars in my photographs for some reason. You know, you don't see that anymore. You know, uh, you you see a Fiat car. I mean, very prominent in the photograph of uh, the Lion Gate clock. You know, uh, and and I remember, uh, you know, somebody came up to me during the exhibition at Max Muller Bhavan. It was very funny because there was a year that was put in the caption, which was basically the year of the of 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 when the building came up and she kind of you know very angrily challenged me and said you got to be kidding me i mean there were no there were no fiat cars then you know so so things like that were happening but i think i mean uh, so so these were these were the kind of things that one was you know kind of trying to see uh, you know you know what what uh, you know what what uh, i mean these, these sort of the changing aspects of the city you know, so if you look at, for instance, again, I mean, you know, the Rajabai Tower, it's again one of the trickiest photographs because you know it's 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 been shot by everybody so many times. I mean, uh, and it's not necessarily that my photograph is is the most successful attempt. But what I'm trying to say is, if you see there, and you see some of the older photographs, I mean, you know, you you see uh, you see more contemporary makes of cars. I mean, which are the taxis in those frames, you know, and and it's not the the fiat cars and you know the older older makes of cars that you see so i think i mean you you if if one is looking at these photographs carefully i mean you know i think there are all these signs that are kind of evident you know of of how the city has changed i mean uh, you know over time i mean for instance i mean wires crisscrossing wires which weren't a nuisance i mean say earlier when one was photographing right it, it became a nightmare towards you know in in the in the more recent years sure. I mean, so so things of that kind i mean yeah yeah chiro this brings me now to the question that i kind of flagged a little earlier mm. uh, in terms of where you would contextualize your work now as a viewer when i come to your work and thinking of the different bodies of work i mean i remember when i saw your uh, work on the commuters i was just very very forcefully struck by how it might be in a lineage and in no way do I mean a direct influence, but if I had to contextualize it, I would think of David Goldblatt's incredible uh, portraits of, uh, of South African laborers uh, right. forced to travel mm. hours and hours to the right. satellite townships where they were forced to live under apartheid and right. commute back and forth uh, right. to the white city. So that's something that definitely comes to mind. When I think about a uh, surrealist kind of work like this, the clocks. I'm t I tend to think of uh, Bent and Hilla Becker's uh, typologies right. of you know the great great right. industrial architecture, right? Um, whether they're cooling towers or other forms, right? And uh, also um, more of a contemporary uh, Tasir Batniji's work of uh, uh, the Palestinian uh, artist who's got this series of uh, Israeli watchtowers with. Mm -hmm. um, the work mm. of decay, graffiti, resistance, whatever, inscribed upon it. So I, I thought I'd uh, maybe draw you out on, 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 your, uh, on your influences, on your context, where you would locate yourself mm. uh, in terms so, of a kind of working operational history of photography. So, uh, so I think when I started out, I mean, you know, my, my influences was very much, uh, you know, uh, photojournalism, very reportage kind of work, uh, you know, uh, obviously I was uh, looking at, you know, the old masters, you know, like like the Bressos and, you know, uh, Eugene Smith, uh, Don McCullin and, and all of those. 
but I think what what happened, and I think there was a, there was also you know uh, I think in the early years, I think in in uh, you know when one is working as a news photographer, I think there was there was also this sort of sense of machismo, you know, which comes with news photography. Uh, uh, and I think one one sort of I think that's what kind of drew one, you know, to uh, once I needed to be in the middle of events, in the thick of events. It was more event oriented, you know, it was more, uh, I need to get a photograph which would, uh, which would get a response out of, a more immediate response out of an audience, you know what I mean? That sort of stuff. Uh, but I think uh, my, my interest, my, my influences, I think, for instance, Eugene Smith kind of stayed with me uh, for, for very long. I mean, I think I continue, uh, though I don't do, though my work is in no way, uh, you know, similar to, you know, Eugene Smith's practice. But I think what I really loved about Eugene Smith's practice, for instance, was a, a kind of an obsessive uh, drive, you know, an obsessive kind of pursuit. I mean, I think when I think about it, I think that's, that was what I kind of took out of Eugene Smith. You know, like when I look at his, say, his Minamata project, or say when I look at uh, his, uh, you know, his, his Pittsburgh project, for instance. I mean, this kind of mad sort of, you know, chasing something, you know. Uh, I mean, I, I was, uh, at one point, I, I got introduced, though much later, to, uh, to, to the work of Walker Evans. I mean, you know, again, I mean, for instance, I mean, Walker Evans, I mean, you know, like, uh, like Bonden Hela Bakar, I mean, also kind of had, you know, these, these series of photographs of, you know, these these churches, I mean, which were, which kind of really remind me again of uh, these photographs, uh, you know, uh, sort of a typology kind of thing. Uh, and I think very, uh, you know, so it, it was sort of photography, which wasn't very overtly dramatic. Uh, I think with time, I think I started moving, I started finding myself moving away from you know, the excessively dramatic, uh, you know, kind of photographs that kind of interested me in the beginning of my career. I think it kind of, I was, I was more interested in sort of, uh, you know, uh, staying with an idea rather than, you know, just kind of, you know, parachuting into a situation and photographing and getting out and feeling good about it and you know all, all that sort of stuff i think i th but i think this also happened very early in my career you know uh, so i think uh, for instance another thing that kind of got me very 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 interested and this i think was uh, you know when i was working on say a village in bengal uh, village in bengal was a bit of a, uh, a, a, a curious work because you know uh, i mean I, I i you know most of my work is to do with Bombay. And this is really a sort of a counterpoint to all of that. I mean, you know, and I think in many ways, I mean, this thing which we in Bombay keep saying, oh, you know, I, I you know, this is the city that I love, but it's also a city that, I mean, we kind of tend to abuse. This is a city we want to run away from. Uh, but I mean, most of us don't find that place that we want to run away to. I think I found this village of Ahmadpur, which was my ancestral village, as the place that I want, I, I thought I would run away to. Uh, and I think that's how this very long engagement kind of began. But I think the problem there was that, uh, you know, something that I, I didn't know how to create narrative. So I think, uh, you know, it, it kind of coincided with, uh, uh, you know, say me beginning to read uh, the writings of of Shotojit Rai, me beginning to kind of read the writings of say Hitchcock. I mean, you know, and both these people who would kind of talk at great length, you know, about process and about uh, this whole thing of building narrative, uh, though in a completely different medium. I mean, you know, uh, they they had they had uh, the advantage of sound, for instance. I mean, which I didn't. But I think I mean these were. Uh, you know, I, I also kind of, uh, you know, I think I have more friends who are writers than, say, who are photographers. And I think I, I, I kind of figured that, you know, this thing which a lot of us photographers tend to fetishize as, you know, this long-term project is, uh, 
I mean, I think it's it's a little silly because I mean, I I have like writer friends who kind of have been laboring on their novels and stuff for years. I don't see anybody kind of you know fetishizing the period that it's taken them to write it. You know, so uh, so I think I mean, it's just it's just uh, the a very uh, I think it comes very naturally to me to kind of you know hunker down and kind of just stick with an idea and just keep digging and digging and digging. You know, uh, and and uh, I think it also comes out of you know. Sometimes I think it's a little strange to say this, but I think there is a there is a collector tendency in me. So I'm kind of collecting public clocks. You know, I'm kind of collecting uh, you know, uh, say graffiti in the train. I'm kind of collecting abandoned helmets around the city, just as much as say I'm collecting Gandhi figurines. You know, so 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 I think I mean, I think it's a tendency that. Kind of is uh, I, I, sometimes I think that's that's the way that I'm wired. You know that I mean I I I kind of just like to sit and keep chipping away and chipping away and chipping away at things. Uh, I also think I mean you know this is I mean when I look at say the the clocks project when I look at say a village in Bengal you know uh, I mean you know village in Bengal was really short for five days each year. Over a period of thirteen years, I mean, so that's basically sixty-five days of shooting. When I look at that work, I mean, I sometimes think, oh, you know, you could have gone there for one Durga Puja and done the entire thing. But the thing is, I mean, you know, I grew up in Bombay with very little sense of what it meant to be a Bengali. So, uh, you know, uh, so so how could I photograph in a place? uh that i didn't know about it took me that many years along with figuring out giving myself an education about say how do you construct a narrative it was also about understanding the place kind of figuring out what is not the important photograph just as much as it is important to know what is the important photograph you know what i mean so uh in fact you know if you uh, there there was a process that i used to do uh can i just share a screen quickly to show you something i mean i i uh i'll just yes, share yes. I'll, i'll just share the screen uh it's you know it's something that uh that often uh in in the photography fraternity uh gets people laughing a lot but i think uh you know it's it's a, so you know th- this is a sort of an excel sheet uh that i that i had okay you know i i used to draw when i was in school and college i mean so i can draw but i mean i think by the time photography happened i think i started losing uh, the patience to sit and draw so this thing that i was talking about village in bengal you know so i had created much like a storyboard uh, a sort of uh, you know uh, an excel sheet which had sort of plotted the entire story now people would often kind of tell and this kind of changed over over time i mean you know so i think uh, i think by by year 6 or 7 it kind of got pretty much finalized and uh, i would keep making these these notes to myself you know as per my you know the 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 image uh, as as per the the story that i was carrying in my head so in the minutest of detail i mean for instance i mean you know there are a lot of pictures from here which aren't there in the book because this is an old draft uh, you know so i mean there be notes to myself which say you know that's a weak photograph or you know try a new photograph here you know things of that kind there would also be details of you know should it be a a vertical image or a horizontal image because i usually like to start designing stuff because as early in the game as possible you know in the sense are you beginning to think how is this work going to be disseminated is it a book is it an exhibition is it what so so i think it might change i mean over time but i think i mean it gives me some kind of direction so so i wanted to show you this just to give an idea you know i think this is the kind of uh obsessive work that i like like to be like to do i mean you know it kind of i think it's it's very immersive as far as i am concerned you know uh, i i wish i could have shown you similar stuff uh for uh for you know the commuters but i mean those those files have got corrupted those were kind of notations of another kind i mean how it was being done the book how it was being design but but i think so i think this is why the long term project you know i mean how much ever i hate that term i mean this is why the this sort of 
very long engagement with ideas kind of interest me you know because very often from where i have started i can see how the idea kind of keeps taking on a life of itself keeps getting refined and then you know uh eventually kind of taking shape by the time it's kind of ready to be shown you know like this clocks project could never have been done i mean you know it i mean you know after we met the other day at project 88 i was actually informed about another clock so it's actually 87 and not 86 <laughs> so how do i know what when to stop you know well it's a, so, it's I mean, an a unfinished like, unfinishable yeah. project <laughs> but in a way i was actually going to ask you how how you decide hmm. what medium or outcome a project should have would it be hmm. a photo essay hmm. an exhibition a book and so on but hmm. you've already dealt with that but i thought i'd just put in place um, something that i bring with me to to our conversation because um, as you know i'm kind of working on an essay on this series so uh, for me an important reference point in this question of time i've been fascinated by the question of representations of time whether that's in the pahari miniatures through synoptic narrative or through or in cinema or many other frameworks but uh, an essay that's very important to me in this context uh, which i read around the time you started working on uh, on on your series mm. uh, is uh, the historian shumit sarkar's uh, uh, essay renaissance and kaliyug which is about uh, concepts of time experiences of time in colonial Cal- 19th century calcutta uh, and i've always been struck by um, mm. you know how he talks about sri ramakrishna's notion of chakri time mm. Uh, mm. which to sri ramakrishna was normally thought of as a rather unworldly figure it was actually an extremely worldly set of reflections on how uh in his view bengalis and thus indians at large were bound by the clock they were prisoners of the chakri clock the office clock mm-hmm. they were what in japan would be called salary men so uh in his view that is that was an emancipation that, that that indians needed to give themselves to break away from chakri time and the clock so whenever when i look at your work i'm strongly reminded of that of that essay of that idea and it also strikes me that uh, you know these <coughs> clocks are also very much Uh, uh, a part of that culture of of uh, chakri time of uh, you know the iron law of wages mm. mill shift right. and all of this apart from everything else we talked about and in some ways it's almost as if they are going to going to be rendered obsolescent as we now work with different scales of temporality so i just wanted to 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 share that with you i'm also very intrigued by the way in which your clocks shuttle between a history of utility and a history of ornament and in fact, uh, sorry in fact yeah. uh, in fact i remember you know uh, obviously you know we were talking about you know engaging with ideas in long longer longer periods i mean so obviously when i started doing the project i mean you know it, i mean i had i i wasn't i i hadn't uh, you know gotten into this whole thing of reading the city i mean you know uh, all of that i mean but i think with as, as the years went by i mean i think i i figured uh, that you know the, the the idea is really you know i think people uh, I, i think it's 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 very simplistically seen as you know uh, about bombay's public clocks but i think it's really a story of technology you mm-hmm. know it's, it's really yeah. a story of like you said of obsolescence of technology and the redundancy of the yeah. technology and you know uh, which which is obviously why so many of the clocks uh you know now that they're not working i mean no one's bothered to kind of you know uh to get them repaired i mean that that whole economy of you know yes. the getting a clock working is this kind of uh has kind of disappeared i mean there are just two people in the whole city who basically can take care of these clocks now wow. you know one of them goes up the rajabai tower and there's another guy you know so there are just two people incredible you know, yeah vanishing occupations yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so i uh, chiro i wonder if we might open this up to questions sure, that people sure. might have um sure. should we look at the chat or the q is there a q and a or there's a chat thank you um ah okay one of the questions we had here from basundara selamuthu uh, is i think exactly what we just talked about i wondered if you could comment on the proliferation of clock towers in indian cities because of colonialism and derogatory notions of indian time mm. so you know, one of the things is i'm not uh, you know like i was telling you the other day i you know i i mean there's this number like 80 80 87 clocks in bombay i mean is this so 
it just has me gobsmacked every time i think about it i can't for instance sure calcutta has has a lot of public locks i mean i've seen some i mean you know i can't think another city having so many i mean you know i'd be i'd be really surprised i mean you know if uh you know so i i, I don't know if you know i mean this is probably someone else needs to 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 work and find this out to I me mean, you know is there really a reason why bombay has so many if if it indeed has so many more than others you know so you know like sherlock holmes had his baker street irregulars to <laughs> network of informants you That's obviously right. have a, yeah. you have a city wide <laughs> network of informants yeah. but you also have a nationwide <laughs> you have people writing to you from jaipur and hyderabad and places saying hey you know just yeah yeah, yeah 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 <laughs> <laughs> in fact it's it's kind of strange because i travel to other cities you right. know and and i mean i look out of the car window and invariably i i spot a clock you know so so it's really strange they don't seem to seem to leave me you know so <laughs> <laughs> so i do not think we have any other questions shri nothing else nothing else at the moment ranjit i think you answered everything people would want to ask <laughs> I know well, that was a fantastic dis- uh, discussion. Thank you very much, both of you, you. for Thank you. Um, taking time on Thank Sunday. You. And uh, I don't know if there's anything else anybody wants to say before we wind up. Chiro, Ranjit. No, I think we're good. I was just looking yeah. into the chat to see if people had questions, <laughs> but okay. So, all right thank you very much you. everybody you for so joining much. us thank thanks you. to ranjit thank and uh, i want to thank sabia who's done all the tech for us and uh, have a lovely sunday everybody thank, thank you. you thank you Th- thank you this was wonderful take thank care bye 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 thanks ranjit thanks shiro thanks shri sabia bye. see you all bye.